two beasts become friends. That's the topic of today's lecture. And the question is, who are these two beasts? And how does it impact upon us? Well, we can only understand these beasts if we have studied Daniel chapter 7, where the attributes of this beast are explained to us. Now, we're not doing Daniel chapter 7 because we're doing a Revelation seminar. There is, however, a whole video on that subject. In Daniel chapter 7, the attributes of the beast power are given. Uh, there it is described as a horn, which is also in Daniel a political entity or a king. A king or a kingdom. And this power would be diverse from the first, different to all the other kings. Now if you study Daniel 7, you'll see that the attributes given there will be taken up again in Revelation 13. So the same system will be described in a different format in Revelation chapter 13. But what is interesting about this political entity is that it's different from all the others. And the reason why it is different, because it's also ecclesiastical. It is also a religious system. Because its main emphasis is religion. It has a quarrel with the saints of the Most High, and it is blasphemous towards the Most High. Daniel 7.25 says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and he shall wear out the saints. So this has a political agenda, and it has a religious agenda of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. It will change the times, and it will change the laws. Fascinating. If you think about this system, and this system apply, can apply only to one institution, and that is Rome. No other institution covers every single aspect of the little horn power. We haven't got time to go into all the details. It has changed the times and it has changed the laws. The laws of God and the times of God. We'll come to that a little later. And they shall be given into his hand until the time and times and the dividing of times. We pick this prophecy up in Revelation chapter 11 where they would have controlling power for these three and a half prophetic years, the 1,260 prophetic days, the 1,260 literal years. Now the beast of Revelation 13 is a conglomerate of what we had in Daniel chapter 7. There are various aspects surrounding this animal. It has the head of a lion, the mouth of a lion. Now lion, the lion represented Babylon in Daniel chapter 7. Then it has the feet of a bear, and the bear represented Medo-Persia. And then it has the body of this leopard, and the leopard represents Greece in Daniel chapter 7. And then it has the ten horns, and these seven heads, and this, these ten horns represent uh, the ten kingdoms that we have in terms of the creatures in Daniel chapter 7 and the toes of the statue in Daniel chapter 2. So this is a conglomerate beast having components, philosophies if you like, of Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome and uh, Babylon. And it speaks with the mouth of a lion. So it speaks Babylonian language. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast arise out of the sea. Sea, nations, peoples, multitudes, the waters that you saw. So it comes out amongst the nations, having seven heads, ten horns, and upon its horns ten crowns. And upon his head the name of blasphemy. There you have the link with Daniel chapter 7. This blasphemous power that is against the Most High comes up amongst the nations and in Daniel chapter 7 we see that it comes up in Rome, in the Roman Empire and particularly the Western Roman Empire and this influence would spread across the entire world. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. It therefore has Greece in it. It has Grecian philosophy, if you like, 
and uh, the Roman Church certainly has uh, the philosophy of the Greeks in it because it uh, supports Aristotle and all of these great philosophers and Oregon and all the Greek scholars that arrived later in the Roman Empire are also uh, represented and his feet were as the feet of a bear does Rome have Medo-Persian philosophy? Absolutely. Mitraism is the main thrust of the religion. It even has the triple crown which comes from Medo-Persia. And the mouth was the, the mouth of the lion is the Babylonian religion of Isis and Osiris, of Baal and Ashtoreth. Are all these religions embodied in it? The answer is yes. If we go to Babylon, the lion was a symbol of Babylon. But the sad story is that the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Revelation chapter 1 and 2 complete, or verses 1 and 2, tell us the sad story that behind this power is the dragon. And the dragon is none other than the devil. Revelation chapter 12 verse 9 identifies the dragon as Satan. But Satan works through human agencies. In Revelation chapter 12, the dragon worked through pagan Rome and attempted to destroy Jesus. Was a Roman official who tried to kill the baby Jesus, a governor who condemned Jesus, an executioner who crucified him, an emblem sealed his tomb, and a guard watched his tomb. So there is the Roman aspect. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. So this religious political entity would blaspheme God. And power was given him to continue 40 and 2 months. There is the 42 month period. 42 times 30 prophetic days is 1,260 days. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name. That's the character of God. And his tabernacle. That's the sanctuary service. That means the path of salvation, which is explained there, robs people of the saving power of Jesus Christ. Has this power done this? Yes, is that substituted saints and Mary and all kinds of intermediaries, even the church itself and its uh, delegates, to mediate on behalf of man and them that dwell in heaven, and thus they blaspheme the very God of heaven. Revelation 13, 5 and 6. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Revelation 13, verse 5. So it would do this openly, publicly, for those forty-two prophetic months. Forty-two months, forty-two times thirty, 1,260 days, a day for a year. I've given you a day for your year. Ezekiel 4, verse 6. That brings us to the same story that we found in Revelation chapter 11, where Vigilius ascended the papal chair 538 AD under the protection of Belisarius. That's history. So we have a starting date when the papacy started to exercise the power from the decree that Justinian had issued, giving it the power to correct all heretics, those who dared to think for themselves. So the legally recognized supremacy of the Pope began in 538 AD and then went into effect the emperor's uh, decree, as I have said, where he was the corrector of heretics. So Rome today still claims to be the sole one who can determine what you should believe because the papacy claims infallibility and cannot make a mistake on doctrinal issues. Uh, Labanca, professor of history at the University of Rome, says to the succession of the Caesars came the succession of the pontiffs in Rome. When Constantine left Rome, he gave his seat to the pontiff. This is based on the so-called letters of Constantine, which are forgeries and have been proved to be such. But nevertheless, that is the story. The transfer of the emperor's residence to Constantinople was a sad blow to the prestige of Rome, and at the time one might have predicted a speedy decline but the development of the church and the growing authority of the Bishop of Rome or the Pope gave her a new lease of life and made her again the capital, this time the religious capital, of the civilized world. That's Abbott's Roman history. That is just a fact. The Bible says, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, 
and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And that is a prophetic statement. This system will control how much of the world? All of it. All of it. So power was given over the saints during the 1260-year per period, but this power would control the whole world. Stanley's history says the popes filled the place of the vacant emperor at Rome, inheriting their power, prestige, titles from paganism. Constantine left all to the Bishop of Rome, which is not true, but nevertheless, the papacy is about, but the ghost of the deceased Roman Empire sitting crowned upon its grave. So we have an emperor. He even has the title. He even has the title Pontifex Maximus, which belonged to the Roman emperor. So in effect, the pope is the emperor of Rome today. Has the church persecuted Western watchmen, Catholic source? Yes, it doesn't deny that it has persecuted that it has used the severest penalties, even death, and had the state execute these penalties. I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death. So there is a mortal wound. And his deadly wound was healed, and some in the world wandered after the beast. Oh no, it doesn't say that. It says, all the world wondered after the beast. Now this over here is a very interesting statement. I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. Some translations say seemed to have a mortal wound. Is there a difference between seemed or as it were and had a mortal wound? Yes or no? Yes. So it seemed to have a mortal wound but Maybe that was deception. Maybe it just copied Jesus Christ, because if this is anti-Christos, anti-Christ in the place of Jesus Christ, it follows the whole concept. This system has placed itself as the mediator. This system forgives the sins. This system gives you a new lease of life, opens the door to heaven or to hell. And this system also receives a wound and is resurrected, so it is a counterfeit of Christ, if you like. But it seems to have a mortal wound. So that is the 1260-year period, 538 to 1798. One of the heads seemed to have a mortal wound, so in this time period it seems to die, but it doesn't really die. It actually goes underground, but as a beast, it dies because it loses political power. And then that political power will be given back and there is a resurrection of this beast. This is what the Bible is saying. So in 1798, remember, Bertia made his entrance into Rome. He abolished the papal government. Napoleon, with his Freemason army, if you like, established a secular government so says the Encyclopedia Britannica, leaving the Freemason stuff out. Berthier entered Rome on the 10th of February 1798 and proclaimed the Republic, thus fulfilling this prophecy to the letter. Half of Europe thought Napoleon's veto would be obeyed and that with the Pope, the papacy was dead. Modern papacy, Reverend Joseph Rickaby, it's like quoting the Bible. So exactly 1,260 days. The murder of a Frenchman in Rome in 1798 gave the French the excuse to enter. Church history says, and they carried him off into exile, the Pope and the beast received a mortal wound. And I saw one of the heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. Now surely that's not possible. Not everybody is going to follow Catholicism. Revelation 13.3, or are they? That's the question we have to ask. Remember the San Francisco Chronicle article where it said the Vatican was at peace with Italy and the autographs, both sides were very cordial to one another and the wound was healed between the two. Revelation 13.7 says, and power was given him over all kindreds 
and tongues and nations. That's scary. Rome will control the entire world. That's what it says. So, a universal religious power controlling the conscience of the entire world. That's what the promise is. And they worship the dragon. So if you follow the system, unwittingly, you are actually worshipping the dragon which gave power unto the beast. Because it is a deception. Jesus Christ has been replaced by this Antichristos system, something in the place of Jesus Christ, and they worship the beast. So the beast receives homage, and we have a father-son sort of system here, saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So if you oppose it, do you get obliterated by war? Probably. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, We've discussed that already. That's the ministry of Christ. And them that dwell in heaven, God himself is blasphemed, Jesus is removed in their writings, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Revelation 13, 4 to 8. So don't you think it is important that Roman Catholics should know that if they are in this system and knowingly cooperate with this system, that they are actually worshipping the dragon? I was pleased when I found this out. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants are ye whom you obey? Whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness, Romans 6.16. So if you allow, uh, obey the system, well then you are part of it. For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, and I will be like the Most High. He wants the worship. So if we worship the system, we're actually worshipping the dragon. The Pope has been man of the year, and uh, prophets, I believe, have looked down the stream of time. Billy Graham said, he'll go down in history as the greatest of modern popes. Fascinating. He really will, he has a will and a determination to help humanity through spirituality. Well, maybe that should be corrected and say spiritualism. That is marvelous, that is good. I know how difficult it is for leaders on these issues, thus said the Dalai Lama. Now what is this about blasphemy? Revelation 13, 6, he opened his mouth in blasphemy. Daniel 7.25, he shall speak great words against the Most High. What does it mean to speak great words against the Most High? There are two definitions in the Bible. John chapter 10.33, And the Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because thou being a man, make thyself God. So if you say, I'm God, that's blasphemy. Who opposes and exalted is himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. 2 Thessalonians 2 4, describing the Antichrist power, saying that it is God and taking the place of God. He'll do the forgiveness of sins, he'll do these things and the other things. So, the Bible defines blasphemy as assuming any right or power that belongs to God alone. Now let's read papal statements, Ferraris Ecclesiastical Dictionary. The Pope is of so great dignity and so exalted that he is not a mere man, but as it were God and the Vicar of God. So there's a papal statement where the Pope is, he claims to be God, just like the Roman Emperor claimed to be God. So he says it himself. Pope Leo said, we hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. Here's another definition of blasphemy, Luke 5.21. And the scribes and the Pharisee began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? So if you say you can forgive sins, that's blasphemy. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, says 1 Timothy 2 verse 5. Uh, here comes another system. And uh, the Pope says, in the, on the authority of the councils, 
all names which in the scripture are applied to Christ, by virtue of which it is established that he is over the church, all the same names are applied to the Pope. So the papacy takes the place of Jesus Christ. And they claim, God himself is obliged to abide by the judgment of his priests, and either not to pardon or to pardon according as they refuse or give absolution. The sentence of the priest precedes and God subscribes to it. Wow! Dignity and duty of the priest. So the priest is higher than God. The priest will decide whether you are forgiven or not, and God has no choice but to obey his priest. Isn't that pathetic? That's arrogance of the highest order. Here's another statement. The poor sinner kneels at the confessor's feet. He knows he's not speaking to an ordinary man, but to another Christ. He hears the words, I absolve thy sins, and the hideous load of sin drops from him soul forever. Shall I be a priest? These are all Roman Catholic statements. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with a sword must be killed with a sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Revelation 13, 9 to 10. Now Daniel told us something more about this power. It told us that it would change the times and the laws. Now we've already discussed that. The papacy changed the law of God. It took out the second commandment, made the fourth commandment, now the third commandment, applied to Sunday rather than Sabbath, and then it uh, divided the tenth commandment into two so that it still has ten commandments. It's changed the law. Has it changed the times? Has Rome changed the times? Absolutely. Which times has it changed? Just about everything. Which, cat, which calendar are we keeping? We are keeping the Gregorian calendar. The Gregorian calendar. Who was Gre Gregory? He was a pope. Why did Gregory change the calendar? Because he had to change the times. You see? He had to change the times. Now today is a good day to talk about this because today is the feast of Ishtar. Oh, sorry. Let's rephrase that. Today is Easter. And the Feast of Easter and Easter are two very different things. Easter. There is no such thing. You see, the Pash was determined, the Passover was determined by the phases of the moon. And the day of the Passover was determined by the new moon. So when the new moon came, then the days were counted and the Passover could take place on any day. It didn't have to be a, a, a Friday, a Saturday, and a Sunday. The Passover could take place on any day, depending on the phase of the new moon. But the Feast of Ishtar was on the first day of the week. So the papacy changed the calendar in order to bring it in line with the Feast of Ishtar. And today, they've changed the rule of the Old Testament, where you count the days, and made it apply so that Ishtar can only fall on a Sunday. Only fall on a Sunday. Whereas in the past it could fall on any day. Now, that is saying that they distanciate themselves from the Passover lamb. Even worse, if you now, by chance, because this can happen, and it happened just a few years ago, in fact, I can't remember the exact date, when the Pope was in America, that's exactly when it happened, by the way, it just so happened that the Feast of Easter and the Feast of the Passover happened to coincide and be on the same day. Well, what did they do then? Well, then they freak, you see. They don't like that. So the Pope then postpones Easter by one week. And that's what they did. They postponed Easter by one week so that it dare not fall on the day of the Pash because we want nothing to do with the lamb that died for us. We serve another purpose. Ishtar is a pagan feast. So he changed the feast days. He changed the times so that it can fall into line with that. He changed the whole calendar to bring it in line with the pagan feast. And he changed the law of God. So, the, the sword must be killed with a sword. He who kills with a sword must be killed with a sword. Here is the patience of, and the faith of the saints, Revelation 13, 9 to 10. So, 1798, the papacy 
gets a mortal wound, receives a mortal wound. He is killed with a sword as he has killed with a sword before that. And now the prophet looks around. We have a date, 1798, this mortal wound takes place. And I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. Now if C represents peoples, multitudes, nations, tongues, then what must earth represent? A place where you do not have a multitude of peoples and nations and tongues. And I saw another beast, another political entity, coming up out of an area on the planet where there are not peoples and multitudes and nations. So it cannot be Europe, it cannot be Asia, it cannot be those Middle Eastern countries. Here comes another political entity. And it had two horns like a lamb, so it has lamb-like principles, but it'll speak like a dragon. That's interesting. Revelation 13, 11. Now who's this power? Well, let's go to the early reformers. These people were magnificent. I have so much respect for these early reformers. John Wesley, in his notes on Revelation 13, written in 1754, says the two-horned beast, he is not yet come, though he cannot be far off. For he is to appear at the end of the 42 months of the first beast. Now the reformers all clearly said, Rome is the Antichrist, they were watching it. And now they say, well this other beast can't be far off. The question is, which power arises at exactly at this time in an area where there are no great multitudes of nations? There's only one that qualifies, and that would be the United States. Now, many, many years ago, these images were already interpreted as such, although the United States was a relatively insignificant power. Let's have a look at the rise of the United States and see if it fits. The Declaration of Independence was in 1776. The independence was acknowledged by the nations of the world in 1783. In 1787, a uh, constitution of the United States was framed. 1791, the Bill of Rights was added. And in 1798, the very year that Rome receives a mortal wound, France, the mightiest power in Europe at that time, recognizes the independence of the United States. So the same nation that gives the papacy a mortal wound, in the same year, recognizes the United States. So it receives a mortal wound, he looked, the prophet, and he saw another beast arise. Spot on, prophetically. 1863, the Slave Emancipation Act, similar to what Napoleon did in Europe. The Eiffel Tower is a symbol of Freemasonry. The Statue of Liberty is a symbol of Freemasonry. 1798, a very important date, liberty and justice for all. That is the lamb-like principle. A dragon, the previous power said, harry them out of the land or hang them. So that's how the dragon speaks and that's how the lamb speaks. Here is a lamb-like principle. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Jesus said the same. Render unto Caesar what is due unto Caesar, and to God what is due unto God. He didn't come to make, uh, you force you into decisions. You can choose, accept him or reject him. But no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. That's a lamb-like principle. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Oxford History of the American People. Wonderful lamb-like principles. But this constitution will have to be changed if there is to be religious legislation and persecution even. The constitution will have to go. By the way, we have moved from a republic to a democracy. America was not a democracy, it was a republic. You could choose, but there's a vast difference between a republic and a democracy. A vast difference. You know, if ten wolves and one lamb have to vote on an issue as what is for lunch, the lamb will end up being lunch in a democracy. It's ten to one. You understand? 
And a republic has totally different principles to a democracy. The, the constitution is central in a republic, and you cannot just vote it away, but that seems to have changed. The Bible says, Revelation 13, 11, he spoke like a dragon. Now, the dragon gave the first power its seat and great authority, and it used it to do what? To blaspheme God and to persecute the saints. Didn't it do that? Exactly. Do you think the second power could start doing the same thing? Think it's possible? Revelation 12, 17, and the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Oh, so if you cling to the word of God and to what the prophets have said and you obey God's commandments rather than man's commandments, do you think you could get into trouble here with a dragon? So he spoke as a dragon. How did this dragon speak? Let's ask Rome how she spoke. This is the syllabus of Pope Pius IX, given in 1864. The state has not the right to leave every man free to embrace whatever religion he shall deem true. All right, that was dragon language. The church has the right to require that the Catholic religion shall be the religion of the state to the exclusion of all others. Cursed be those who assert liberty of conscience and of worship, and such that maintain that the church may not employ force. That's dragon language, pretty clear. The Roman Catholic Church must demand the right to freedom for herself alone. Catholic statement. The Roman Catholic is to wield his vote for the purpose of securing Catholic ascendancy in this country. Catholic World, July 1870. That's dragon language. But Revelation 13, 12 says, It, the second power, exercises all the authority of the first beast before him. So it will do the same as the first one did in the old world. What then? And causes the earth and those dwelling in it. How much of the world is that? Everybody. To worship the first beast. Aha! Now how do you force someone to worship the first beast? Whose deadly wound was now healed. How do you force, by legislation, someone to worship the first beast? The only way you can do that is through laws which govern the conscience. Is that right? So if the first beast has a rule, or rules, and says, this is the standard that I want implemented, and I feel, hey, I want nothing to do with that, that's contrary to the law of God, and the second power comes along and says, if you don't, sizzle fits. What then? Then the second power is enforcing laws of the first power, and if I then obey those laws, then what am I actually doing? I'm worshipping the first beast, because it made the laws. Isn't that correct? And so I'll be in big trouble with God, because what if those laws are contrary to the law of God? Then I have to make a choice. Okay, but that's what the Bible says what will happen. The second beast will do exactly that. And it does great wonders so that it makes fire come down from heaven onto the earth in the sight of men. What is that? It could be literal fire. And I think we're dealing with spiritual fire here. And it deceives those dwelling on the earth. Now, a literal fire is not very deceptive. It's pretty painful. <laughs> but a spiritual fire, that could be problematic. So the second power will use deception in order to do this because of the miracles which were given to it to do before the beast. So if you see within the second beast, let's say the United States, a power that sends a spirit out, fire, Holy Spirit, but it is a false spirit, and it is a deceptive spirit, and it is full of miracles and signs and wonders, well, then you have a problem. There's a lecture coming up, and it's called Strange Fire. Tuesday evening. Whatever you do, don't miss that lecture. I'm going to show you some strange fire 
that you cannot believe, which were given to it to do before the beast, saying to those dwelling on the earth that they should make an image to the beast who had the wound and by the sword and live. How do you make an image to something? What's an image? An image is something that looks like the original. Isn't that right? If I look into a mirror, what do I see? I see an image, something that looks like me, right? It's not me, it's just an image, but it looks like me. Now, how did the, what did the first beast look like? The first beast was a religious power using the state to enforce its doctrines. Is that correct? So now, what if the second beast becomes a religious power using the state to enforce its doctrines, but those doctrines happen to be the doctrines of the first beast, Rome, and they're forcing the whole world to obey Rome. Wouldn't I be in trouble then? Exactly. But that's what the Bible says, what will happen. The second beast will make laws and enforce them just like the first one did, thereby creating an image, something that is just like the previous one was, and they will enforce laws. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. So this was a pretty powerful uh, political entity. That the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many who would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Do you think the United States has the power to say, if you little country don't listen to me today, away you go. Yes or no? I think so. They have the power to do that. And they certainly have done it of late. Revelation 13, 15. Now isn't it interesting, as we saw yesterday already, that uh, even in the architecture the one is an image of the other. Isn't that fascinating? So this fascinating building and all its laws and statutes, which are protected by the Constitution. Here is the first beast, here's a priest going into the Vatican, and there is a Swiss guard representing the state, protecting the church. Here you have the Pope with all the flags of the nations around him. Is it possible that the nations of the world will rally around him? How the Pope will change the world? Esquire magazine. He certainly will. This was the most charismatic Pope of all times. And uh, Ronald Reagan was the one who started off making a deal which started to contravene the Constitution of the United States. Harry Truman tried to do that in 1951. He got such a blast, even from the pulpit of his, by his own minister, when he wanted to recognize the Vatican, uh, that he dropped it. But uh, Ronald Reagan, no problem. He just did it. Even the president's own Baptist pastor in Washington denounced the idea from the pulpit when Truman did it. Here is a Masonic signal picture. Remember the finger to the mouth, what that meant? That is the sign of Horus. Silence, secrecy. The folded hands mean something. Only President Ronald Reagan and the Pope who were present in the Vatican Library on that day. One of the earliest goals, as President Reagan says, was to recognize the Vatican as a state and to make them an ally. That's contrary to the American Constitution. Both of them received a mini worn wound and lived. That's not significant, it's just interesting. Just interesting. It's almost like the image is following the beast. John Paul's triumph. Here we have another signal picture. We have Gorbachev and the papacy together. They exchanged some gifts. The party comes to an end. Communism had served its purpose. It could go. And the man was without a country. This was a nice joke in the South African magazine. The egg being communism. And he said, Ma, here's the next any. There's nothing in here. You see, it was a ruse to make people believe something or other. And then finally, who would get the credit for the fall of communism? If communism had been set up to subjugate the Orthodox Church and to eliminate Protestant thinking in the east of Germany, which it certainly did, once it had accomplished that, communism could go and be dissipated. And who would get the credit for that? 
the Pope would get the credit for that. How do we know that? Because Mary had already, supposedly, in Fatima said, the Pope will consecrate the whole world to the Immaculate Heart of Mary and Russia will be converted. That was easy to say because the Bolsheviks had just taken power in 1917, the very year when that statement was made. They knew they had it in the bag, not too difficult. The three secrets, not too bad either. The first was a vision of hell, which makes no sense whatsoever. The second one was Russia will be consecrated. They'd taken power anyway. And the third one was that a future pope would receive an attack on his life, but survive and issue in the final events. Now, if you know history in advance because you are creating it, that's no problem. Now, did the papacy receive the honor for that? Well, let's ask the presidents of the United States whether that is so. This is the papal visit to the United States since Louis. Let's ask the then time President Bill Clinton to tell us what he thinks. 2,400 of his faithful here to welcome him. He's waving to the crowd. Archbishop Regali is alongside the Pope as he shakes hands with the First Lady. We honor you for helping to lead a revolution of values and spirit in Central Europe and the former Soviet Union, freeing millions to live by conscience, not coercion, and freeing all of us from the constant fear of nuclear war. Your Holiness, on behalf of all of us gathered here today, indeed on behalf of all the people of our beloved nation, we welcome you back to America. Ladies and gentlemen, His Holiness Pope John Paul II and the Vice President of the United States and Archbishop. So who received the honor for bringing down the Soviet Union? The Pope. We honor you for freeing millions. So, interesting fulfillment of prophecy. Herman Melman, America has been settled by people of all nations. All nations may claim her for their own. We are not a narrow tribe of men. No, our blood is as the flood of the Amazon made up of thousands of noble currents all pouring into one. We are not a nation so much as a world. And all the world wondered after the beast. Now that means every single country. Remember the question we had in the beginning? Do you think it's possible that every country would be subject to him? Pope John Paul, superstar. Now this church, the Roman church, claims to be the mother of all the churches. Here it says, Imater Ecclesia, the mother of all the churches. Still to be closed is the most important rift of all between the world's 350 million, that figure has changed, Protestants and about 800 million, that figure has changed to 1.2 billion by now, today. However, hatchets are being buried. So not only in the political sphere must she gain ascendancy, but also in the religious sphere. And that will take a whole lecture by itself. Now, religiously, all the religions must come together and be subject to the system. Roma said, this is Pope John Paul II, this is their own Catholic magazine, Southern Cross, in 1995 he said, for unity, all churches must accept papal authority. Now, I have news for you that that not only includes Christian churches, that includes all religions of the entire world. And then hands across the sea, Runcy, and the papacy make a deal, and Christian unity comes into being. And he performed great and miraculous signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to earth in the full view of men, Revelation 13, 13. So the second power would now use religion as an entering wedge for uniting the world under one system. Question. In the last few years, has religion become a topic on this planet, yes or no? Uh -huh. 
and which religions are representing thesis and antithesis. The Judeo-Christian culture pitted against the Islamic culture, and out of that must come a synthesis. We are living in interesting times. Because of the signs he was given power to do on behalf of the first beast, he deceived the inhabitants of the earth. Acts chapter 2 verse 3, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came down to rest on them. Is it going to use some form of religious fervor, supposedly by the Holy Spirit, because fire came down, that was the Holy Spirit's outpouring upon the people? Is religious fervor going to bring about the clash? Do you think that's possible? Wow, I think it's never been more possible than today. The Bible, I believe, is spot on. The Bible tells us that the United States of America, which will arise at exactly the right time, will change its tune from lamb-like principles to dragon principles and become a persecuting power just like Rome was of old, and that the whole world would follow this beast. In our previous section now, we saw the rise of the United States. We saw the principles of the papal power. We saw that the Bible predicted that the second power, the beast out of the earth, would adopt the same principles as the first one and enforce them universally. He was granted power, says Revelation 13, 15, to give breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak, so this new religio-political power would make its voice heard, and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. You either go along with this, or you're out. So the basic tenant is, shape up or ship out. Isn't that right? That's it. Shape up or ship out. Well, you know, the President of the United States is making noises like that. You're either for us or against us. Did he say that? Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Church and state, are they going to work together? Is there going to be an image, something to pay homage to? Is the Constitution going to be amended? Great controversy, page 445. The image of the beast represents that form of apostate Protestantism which will be developed when the Protestant churches shall seek the aid of the civil power for the enforcement of their dogmas. It is a mistake to apply American democratic procedures to the faith and the truth. Time magazine, January 1995. Well, that's contrary to the Constitution. They call that a mistake these days. Well, remember, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. There's a nice package deal there, Revelation 13, 16 to 17. Here are the issues that are at stake. So if you do not take the mark of the beast, that's the first beast. So we have to ask, what is the mark of the first beast? Now today people think that is a computer mark or a chip in the hand. That might be a means of controlling buying and selling. And yes, there are devices that have been created to put in your hand or under the skin of your forehead, which will say where you are and what your banking details are and work like a credit card and all these things. But my question to you is this. Is a credit card something that dictates the conscience? Yes or no? Is a dollar note something that dictates the conscience, yes or no? No. What dictates conscience, right or wrong? And this is a mark, a distinguishing feature, if you like, of the first beast, which is Catholicism. Is a computer chip a distinguishing feature of Catholicism, yes or no? Or are we dealing with doctrine? Surely we are dealing with doctrine. Is God concerned if your can of beans is scanned by a barcode, 
and leaves you out of heaven because of that? Yes or no? Or is God concerned if you decide not to obey Him, but rather an earthly power contrary to His will? Would He be concerned then? Yes. It's a question of allegiance. So, yes, maybe there will be a chip. Maybe they will enforce it on the hand and enforce it on the forehead. Whatever. That's not the mark of the beast, because the beast has been defined as Catholicism. Did a computer chip change the law of God, yes or no? Did a computer chip persecute the saints? Did a computer chip change the times? No. So, buying and selling, you can only do it if you accept the mark of the beast. Here is wisdom. Let him that has understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and 6. It is the number of a what? A man, not of a can of beans in Walmart or wherever, right? It's not a can of beans, it's the number of a man. Well, here's a man. What are the letters inscribed on the Pope's crown and what do they signify of anything? The letters inscribed on the Pope's mitre of Vicarius Feli Dei, which is the Latin for the Vicar of the Son of God. So, there it is, Vicarius Feli Dei. And if you add that up numerically, if you give the Latin numerical value to the names, numbers, then you get to exactly 666. And there is no way of getting around that one. For a while there, this mitre disappeared and the people said there was no such title. But of course it is in the articles of the papacy, though they cannot deny that that title literally exists. Triple six symbolizes the union of error. In Greek, you have Greek numerical value. The Latin kingdom, Helatina Basilea, if you add the Greek numerical value, you get to 666. The Italian church, Italica Ecclesia, 666. The Latin-speaking man, these are all official titles of the papacy. They all work out to 666. That's interesting. So the, the system has a number 666, and the man, the Antichristos, Vicarius Feleidae, Vicar of God here on earth, it means literally in the place of Jesus Christ. That's what it means. So, in actual fact, the papacy says, call me in the place of Jesus Christ, in the place of his anti, call me antichrist. Couldn't have done us a bigger favor. He identifies himself. Mark of the beast, what is that? First, we must understand God's mark, his seal or his sign. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. Remember we discussed this when we discussed the earlier chapters of Revelation? Cried with a loud voice, and it was given him to earth the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, till we have sealed the servants of our God in the forehead, so settled in them in the truth that they cannot be moved. The seal authenticates a document. So the president has a seal. Moreover, I gave them my Sabbaths, that there might be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctifies them. Ezekiel 20.12 and of course, if you take that sign, it's oat, it means a mark. God has a mark. So God's seal contains his name, his title, his territory. I, the Lord, Yahweh, his title, creator, territory, heaven and earth. It's in the heart of his law. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shalt labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord, Yah God. For, why? In six days, Yahweh, the Lord, made creator heaven and earth. By the way, remove the Sabbath, as we have said before, and the entire law has no stamp of authority. It could be from Joe Schmo. But because the Sabbath is in there, the entire law gets its authority from none other than the creator of heaven and earth. So now, what if you take this law and you modify it, and you put a different stamp on there. What do you do then? What happens then? So Satan has attacked the Sabbath because it is the seal of God, it is the mark of authority which makes the whole of the law valid. 
Remember Daniel 7.25? He will think to change times and laws. Well, let's ask the Pope whether he does that. Decretal de translat episcop. The Pope has power to change times, to abrogate laws, to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. That's pretty arrogant. He can do whatever he likes. No wonder he has the sign of Horus on his lapel over there. That's the symbol of Horus, by the way. Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever, Hebrews 13.8. Jesus doesn't change, so why should the papacy have the right to change the law of God? What specifically is the mark of the beast? Well, what's the best way of finding out? Isn't the best way of finding out asking? Why don't we ask them, what's your mark? The mark of the beast must be a sign of the Roman Church's authority, mustn't it? Let's ask them. Cardinal Gibbons. Of course the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act, changing Sabbath to Sunday, and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. So she claims it is her mark of power. Here's another statement, Catholic Records, September 1, 1923. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible and this transference of Sabbath observant is proof of that fact. So if this is an in-your-face God, we the church have power to change your law and our stamp of approval that we can do it, our seal, is that we change the day of worship. By the way, which is the international day of worship today? Sunday. Sunday, that's right. In Muslim countries, the day of worship is on Friday. But on which day is, are the stores closed? Sunday. On Sunday, that's right. In Israel, the day is the Sabbath. But on which days are the banks closed? On Sunday. And the Minister of the Interior wants to introduce Sunday as the second rest day. That's interesting. Schafft endlich eine Weltregierung, says the Pope. Get on with it. Get on with the world government. On his tour to Poland, Pope John Paul denounced excessive materialism and the separation of church and state, time 17, 1991. So what about the union of church and state, where the American Constitution separates them? I want to hear some Americans stand up and shout, give us justice, give us decency, and to hell with the Constitution. That was the Catholic News already in 1963. This is Rehnquist, he's the Chief Justice of the, uh, of the United States. He said, the wall of separation between church and state is a metaphor based on bad history. That's a sad statement. Wow. A metaphor which has proved useless as a guide to judging, it should be frankly and explicitly abandoned. Okay, is the United States beginning to speak like a dragon, yes or no? It's very much dragon language. There it is. Rehnquist said these very words. A metaphor based on bad history. Here's Keith Tunia, Time Magazine, 1995. He said, The wall of separation between church and state that was erected by secular humanists? Hello, can they twist the truth? And are they enemies of religious freedom? I thought it was put there by the friends of religious freedom, didn't you? Well has to come down. Those opposing our views are the new fascists. Now that's interesting. This is the pot calling the kettle black. Isn't that fascinating? So now a fascist is calling a fascist a fascist. That is Jesuit dialectic thinking. It's brilliant. It's so clever. Because only a fascist can make a rule dictating conscience. And if you refuse to obey the, a rule because you accept another rule, then you, by principle here, are a fascist because you are accepting a totalitarian regime. You are accepting God. But they are accepting another one, and that's the state. You see? Fascinating. The clash is becoming interesting. St. Louis Post-Dispatch, as the second century of the Bill of Rights draws to a close, the Supreme Court is redefining what religious liberty will mean in the third century. Broadly, the court's new approach helps conventional religions while hurting unconventional ones. You better join the ship or else. 
Is that what it says? Okay, it gets worse. I am the bearer of bad news. But fortunately, I am all cheerful about it. Have you noticed? And uh, that's something people find very hard to understand. I'm all cheerful about it, not because I have discovered this, because I haven't. I'm just a parrot, repeating what many people have discovered. I'm cheerful about it because it is the fulfillment of prophecy. And when prophecy is fulfilled, it tells me who is in control. Who's in control? God is in control. And as it fulfills, I know I'm going home soon. And the sooner, the better. Get on with it. Finish it so that we can go home. No more tears, no more crying, no more crime, no more death, no more rape, no more terrible things that happen to little children. All of it gone. No more keys, no more anything. Wow. That'll be just great. It seems to be plain. This is Justice William O'Douglas. It seems to be plain that by these laws, the states compel one under sanction of law to refrain from work or recreation on Sunday because of the majority's view on that day. The state by law makes Sunday a symbol of respect or adherence. Pat Robertson said, the next obligation that a citizen of God's world order owes to is to himself. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy as a command for the personal benefit of each citizen. Higher civilizations rise when people can rest and draw inspiration from God. Laws in America that mandated the day of rest, Sunday laws, have been nullified as a violation of separation of church and state. As an outright insult to God. Oh, isn't that interesting? And his plan, only those policies that can be shown to have a clearly secular purpose are recognized. So what is he saying? Forget about that stupid constitution that separates church and state. Let's do something else. Let's get church and state together. Can you see an image of the beast arising here? Wow, this is fascinating stuff. So church and state will work together and legislate laws which will honor the first beast. Who changed the Sabbath to Sunday? The Roman Catholic Church. If they enforce Sunday, who will they be honoring? Rome. They will be honoring Rome. And then, Sunday Times, 5-7-1998, Pope launches crusade to save Sunday. Make it clear that Sunday must not be worked since it must be celebrated as the day of our Lord. He brought out a whole encyclical. I'm just going to breeze through it. He says it's tradition. They celebrate the Eucharist. He talks about an encyclical, Rerum Novarum, and he asks for laws legislating respect their duty to keep Sunday holy. He asks for civil legislating legislation which will enable us to keep Sunday. Now, the United States should say, our constitution forbids this, I'm terribly sorry, Mr. Pope, but church and state are separate, we cannot concur. Did they do that? No. Here's the statement. There is Bush, just after he became president, he cut the ribbon to this new museum, this multi-million dollar Roman Catholic museum, and he says the best way to honor Pope John Paul II, truly one of the great men, is to take his teachings seriously, is to listen to his words and put his words and teachings into action here in America. And that's the highest official in the government saying, let's listen to the Pope. Is that removing the separation between church and state, yes or no? Absolutely. This is a challenge we must accept. I have a problem with you, Mr. President. You are speaking like a dragon, isn't he? Absolutely. Is he fulfilling prophecy? Yes. So am I angry with him? No. Please. That he's there and can fulfill the prophecy because that means we can go home. He exercises all the power of the first beast. Has he got power to tell nations and individuals what to do? Yes or no? Absolutely. And causes the earth and then that dwell therein to worship the first beast. You better obey that system whose deadly wound was healed. Rub two religions up long enough, and one will rise like a mushroom to defend itself. Right? 
The unrestrained freedom of thinking and of openly making known one's thoughts is inherent in the rights of citizens and is by no means to be reckoned worthy of favor and support. Pope Gregory. You're not allowed to tell what you are thinking anymore. That's what the Pope said. Pope Gregory said that. Fascinating stuff. Is America beginning to say the same things? Hasn't the President says, those that say such and such and such and such are the new terrorists? You better not say anything against us or else. Did he say that? Oh yes, he's saying the same thing. Interesting. And we've seen this one. If we gain sufficient numerical majority in this country, religious freedom is at an end. Bishop of St. Louis, November 23, 1851. Religious freedom is rapidly coming to an end. There was a Sunday law in the past. On the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and people residing in the cities rest and let all workshops be closed. That was the edict of Constantine. Christians shall not Judaize. Now this is the fascinating part. You know, if the world makes a national Sunday law and says, there you go, everybody must rest on Sunday, I will say, okay, that's fair enough, I don't care. Give me one more day off. If they say everybody must keep Wednesday and Thursday and Friday as well, I'll say, well, that's great, now I can stay home all week. You know what I mean? But there's something else to this law. Look what this law also said. Besides not working on Sunday, what did it say? Christians shall not? Judaize, they may not keep the Sabbath and be idle on Saturday. Aha, so the law must say something more. It must prevent me from obeying God. Interesting. But shall work on that day, but the Lord's day they shall especially honor. Now the same happened with Pharaoh. Pharaoh issued a decree, and uh, Moses came up to Pharaoh and said, this is not going to happen. And Pharaoh said to him, you, Moses, you make the people rest. And the word rest that is used there in the Old Testament is Shabbat. You make the people Shabbat, keep the Sabbath. I am telling you, to your works, increase their labor. No more straw gathering for them. Let them work. So what law did Pharaoh made, make? He made an anti-Sabbath law. So did Constantine make an anti-Sabbath law. At the same time, it was a pro-Sunday law, yes. But that's not the important thing for me. The important thing here is that he forbade one to not work on a Sabbath. And Pharaoh did the same thing. Now, what was God's response to Pharaoh when Pharaoh said, I am going to force you to work on the Sabbath day? What happened? Plagues came and sorted him out. Now the Bible says there will be plagues at the end of time to sort such a power out, right or wrong. The parallels are absolutely fantastic. From the Apostles' time until the Council of Laodicea, which was 364, the holy observation of the Jews' Sabbath continued, as may be proved out of many authors, yea, notwithstanding the decree of the Council against it. So the early Christians ignored the papal decrees. That the Sabbath was kept, notwithstanding the decree of the council against it, is also seen in the fact that Pope Gregory I wrote against the Roman citizens, forbid any work done on the Sabbath day. That means Sunday people were working on it. So the early church kept the Saturday. Now here's an interesting decree issued by the first beast. This is the Roman Catholic Church. At the Synod of Toulouse in AD 1163, they issued the following decree. The bishop and priests take care and to forbid under pain of excommunication every person from presuming to give reception or at least assistance to the following of this heresy, which was Sabbath keeping. This was the decree against the Valdenses who chose biblically to keep the Sabbath of the Lord. So the Pope said, heresy, this will not happen. Wherever they shall be discovered, neither were they to have any dealings with them in buying and selling. Oops! So the first beast issued a decree that those who kept the Sabbath would receive economic boycott, no buying or selling. 
that being so deprived of the common assistance of life, they might be compelled to repent of the evil of their way. Whoever shall dare to contravene this order, let them be excommunicated as a partner with them in guilt. As many of them as can be found, let them be imprisoned by the Catholic princes and punished with the forfeiture of all their substance. That was a Roman Catholic decree. You cannot buy and sell if you continue Sabbath keeping, and we will take everything you own away. And then did they listen, the Valdenses? No. So what was the next thing that then happened? King Idolfonsus of Aragon banished all the Valdensias in, in 1194 as a consequence, and then they sent in the military and they decimated them. They killed them. So there was a Sunday law, there was an anti-Sabbath law included in that, and there was no buying and selling and a death decree. That's what the first beast did. Do you think the second beast might become like the first one? Do you think it's possible? Do you think the image might do the same thing? Well, it just said so. All businesses, here, Harold Linsell, editor of Christianity Today, all businesses, including gasoline stations and restaurants, should close every Sunday by force of legislative fear through the duly elected officials of the people. So they're asking for the same thing. The Bible predicts a coming confederacy of religions in America attempting to unite church and state. And the people must be whipped up into a religious fervor by an outpouring of a spirit with signs and wonders which will make them convinced that God is with the movement. Does that make sense? It's scary, eh? Huh? I think it's scary. So the coming crisis is similar to that which was in the day of Daniel. The Babylonian king, a powerful world leader, established a counterfeit image and compelled worship contrary to God's command. And the worthies, they refuse to bow down to the image. And as a consequence, there were major problems. Daniel chapter 3 verse 15 says how this religious ceremony was conducted. Now when you hear the sound of, what does it say? All kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good, but if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Do you think music could be important in whipping up a religious fervor? What about all kinds of music? What would that include? That would include light pop music, that would include, for those that love it, beautiful opera music, that would include heavy rock, that would include heavy metal, that would include all kinds of things, don't you think? As long as the people accept the religious fervor, who cares? Music will play a very prominent role. Do you know that the Bible repeats that three times as if the Lord is really trying to say something? Well, let's have a look what happened when the Pope visited St. Louis and the youth was filling the chamber and two monks out here, I think these look like Franciscans according to their dress, they said, at last we have unity, unity, peace, peace on earth. Now what does the Bible say when they start saying what? Peace, peace, then we have a problem. And then as the Pope comes in you will see the young people go hysterical. All kinds of music is being used to satisfy the hunger of all their souls. From Beautiful choir music by ecumenical choirs of all religions singing together. Two, pop music with arms rising and nuns waving their arms and the youth. Two, heavy rock by DC talk and bands like that as the Pope comes in. Then we have dancing in the Lord and all these features. And the Roman Catholic priest is speaking to one of the uh, DJs there, and he says, the, the DJ asks him, or the, the reporter asks the Roman Catholic priest, 
Do you think there is any religion in this loud music? And uh, the priest says, of course, music is, uh, God is in all the great music systems of the world, the great music of the Reformation, and this music, well, <laughs> the young people understand it, that's good enough. Well, let's watch and see what happens. It was great. A great feeling of it was a great excitement, great peace. of peace, D unity. of love, peace, love, and unity. Unity. Yes. Unity? Yes. All nations will come. Now all the nations bowed down. Next nation. Well, in this video clip, I only showed you the nations coming. I can't show you the whole thing. We'll be here all day. But representatively, all the nations in every corner came and bowed down to the Pope. The music and the other issues which I mentioned set the stage for the young people and for the older people. I'll be showing you that clip in another lecture as we continue along this interesting path. So, the world is ready to accept this authority. But the Bible says in Romans 6, 16, Know ye not that to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, he servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. So if we obey this system, and they've asked for laws, the papacy has asked for laws, and the President of the United States says, As you exhort, we will listen, we must introduce this into the United States, the churches are clamoring for legislation regarding the law of God, but Jesus says, come and follow me. Now this is the basis of Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13 describes the two political powers which in essence control the world at the end of time. The one in the Middle Ages, totally Catholic, the other one now representing Protestantism and doing exactly the bidding of the first beast. Has Protestantism, Protestantism totally changed or has Protestantism been infiltrated? That is a good question. Now we will still have to see and we'll have to do a lecture to find out whether Protestantism has been infiltrated and whether the great Protestant preachers really are what they say they are. We will also have to look at this fire, this outpouring of the Spirit of God, in inverted commas, which is flooding the United States of the world, and not only the United States, but the entire world through the media. Is it the right one, or is it not the right one? And what must be our criteria? The Word of God. That's all we have. So you will see there are some lectures coming which are called That All May Be One and Strange Fire. Don't miss those lectures. They're going to be very, very revealing. And we will paint in this picture. And we will see that God has predicted 100% what was going to happen on this planet. And that is why I can lift up my head and be pleased. Because God is in control. Jesus is going to be the ultimate victor. Thank you.